Welcome everybody to the ninth lecture in the ANU Humanities Research Center's 2022 lecture series, Works That Shape the World. This year we're focusing on the ways in which religion has shaped the world. Let me begin by acknowledging the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the traditional owners of the land that the Australian National University is built upon here in Canberra. And let me welcome our special guest today, Dr. Lincoln Rice joining us from Milwaukee. Now, Lincoln is a theologian with a PhD in social ethics from Marquette University. He's the editor of The Forgotten Radical Pete Moran and a member of the Casa Maria Catholic Worker in Milwaukee. Today, Lincoln will be discussing that Catholic worker movement and in particular, its co-founder, Dorothy Day. Now, after Lincoln's presentation, I'll invite everybody here to ask your questions. Um, preferably you can unmute yourself and you can, you can talk with Lincoln or you can always use the chat function or you can use the Q&A function. But um, let's, let's be social and if you're comfortable, please use the raise hand function and I'll, I'll unmute you and you can have a chat with, uh, with Lincoln. We won't be recording that Q&A uh, session either. So with no further ado, I, I'd like to welcome uh, Lincoln Rice and invite you to share your your screen and talk to us about Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here and yeah, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but also uh, on traditional Potawatomi land. So uh, it's something that we've definitely wanted to recognize here uh, in the States and at our Catholic Worker here at Casa Maria. Yeah, our topic for this evening, Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement. Uh, my plan is to go a little bit into the background of the movement, talk about Dorothy Day, uh, her life, writings, works, influences, uh, and then also touch a bit on the Catholic worker movement today. Because uh, even though she passed in 1980, uh, we're now over 40 years past her death and the Catholic worker movement is, I'd say just as vibrant as uh, when she passed. So Dorothy Day is definitely a name that's become more recognizable, uh, particularly in the United States uh, since her death. Um, you know, as uh, I was born and raised Catholic uh, here in the United States, and as someone who went to grade school, Catholic grade school during the 80s, and, you know, was involved in my church, uh, my Catholic church uh, in high school and early college. This wasn't a name that ever came up in my Catholic education. So I will later on touch about touch on how I heard about her. Uh, but if someone is going to a Catholic high school or Catholic university now, uh, she would come up. So she has definitely become a more prominent uh, figure among um, in Catholic. Um, in Catholic education here in the United States. Uh, I, I share this picture. This is when Pope Francis spoke to Congress in September of 2015. And while the reason I put this here is while he uh, spoke to Congress, he mentioned four Americans by name that he thought had attributes that were worthy of recognition and emulation. Uh, oddly enough, two of the people he mentioned were not Catholic. So he mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. He mentioned Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he mentioned uh, Thomas Merton, and he mentioned Dorothy Day. Uh, so Dorothy Day, uh, who you know, who is Dorothy Day? Why do people remember her? Why do people still read her or try to emulate uh, her life and be a part? And why are they a part of her movement? Pope Francis. This is from. Uh, a line from his speech to Congress in 2015, her passion for justice and for the cause of the oppressed were inspired by the gospel, her faith, and the example of the saints. And so there's actually, I think he hits a few things here that are important for uh, who Dorothy Day is and what formed her. Uh, he mentions the gospel, the stories of Jesus's life, you know, the, uh, the Christian scriptures. And in Dorothy's writings, the Christian scriptures, you know, permeate her writings. It's, uh, you know, even 
For many Catholics, it wasn't until the reforms of the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s that they started reading the Bible. Uh, I know my Catholic grandparents were given their first Catholic Bible by my mom and, and by my mom and her sister in like the 1970s. <laughs> that was the first time they ever owned a Bible. Um, but for Dorothy, uh, the Bible is something that she took seriously as part of her daily prayer life. And so she would have perhaps been an anomaly compared to many Catholics during her uh, during her time as a Catholic, going back to the 1920s when she converted to Catholicism. Uh, also, the example of the saints. Uh, the saints were very, the Catholic saints were very meaningful uh, for her, and even those saints outside of the Catholic faith, which we'll touch on briefly. Uh, but she was definitely had a devotion to the Catholic saints and seeing how they lived um, the life of Christ in their own times, in their own cultures and circumstances. Uh, you see that permeate her writings and how she chose to live her life. And, um, and he doesn't mention it here, but I'd also add liturgy and prayer. Catholic, her Catholic prayer life also comes out, uh, particularly notions of um, the Catholic notion of the Eucharist and the mystical body of Christ of seeing um, seeing the divine in everyone, especially those for, in whom many in our society don't see, um, don't see divinity. Um, another, uh, I chose this picture for a reason also, that even though I'll be brief, I'll be shortly kind of moving to the beginning of her life, this was actually her last arrest from uh, 1973. Uh, she joined a boycott uh, by the farm workers movement here in the United States. And they're particularly working on the conditions of grape, uh, grape pickers in California. And so this was her last arrest. Um, she was having health issues at this time already. Um, but I always point out, especially if I'm talking to students, you know, Choosing to get arrested, uh, choosing to do an act of civil disobedience isn't always just you just run out and try to get arrested. You know, she didn't know when she was going to get arrested. She figured she was probably going to get arrested in the for this cause to support the farm workers. Uh, but we can see she goes out there. She brings a chair. She has comfortable clothing. She has a hat, <laughs> a nice broad brimmed hat because it's the hot sun in California. You know, she's a person, she's ready to be there for a while, even given her, you know, her age and her health at that time, she's going out and prepared. But this is definitely one of those iconic pictures of Dorothy Day where she's sitting there with farm workers in the background and you see the police officers there with their weapons. So Dorothy Day, uh, kind of the, the very basics, she was born at the end of the 19th century, uh, lived until 1980. And essentially her journey to God is told in the long loneliness. Uh, we often refer to this as her autobiography. And I would consider it her most important work and that if there is a work that someone wanted to if, if there was one, one, um, one book or one piece of writing of Dorothy Day's that someone was going to explore to find out more about her, this is the one I would uh, recommend, even though it was written almost 30 years before her death. Uh, it really encapsulates her thinking and her life and um, I think captures the best picture of her uh, that we have. Um, Again, many, um, many editions of this book will say her autobiography, she didn't view it that way. She viewed it as her journey to God. And so, you know, there are things missing from that book, things that she didn't view as part of her journey to God, she omits. And so at the end, I'll recommend some other items if someone wanted to know more about um, other parts of her life that she omits, but especially in the 50s, she thought if she talked about some aspects of her life, uh, such as her abortion or her attempted suicide attempt, these would be things that would either cause scandal to young Catholics 
or perhaps be used by them as an excuse to say, you know, she lived kind of a wild life in her late teens and early 20s. And uh, so she chose to omit those things at the time, though they weren't things that um, she was necessarily um, worried about sharing. And these are things she would share with people that she knew and was close to. Uh, but the book is divided into three parts. And so the first part covers more, uh, she doesn't phrase it this way, but maybe more of her biological or very earthly life. And, uh, and I'll say I didn't come up with this uh, kind of trifold vision of the book. Uh, other people have noticed this, that there's almost like there's three men in her life. The, the first part maybe covers growing up under her father, John Day, and how her life progressed there. The second with who would be her common law husband, Foster Batterham. And then the third, when she met the French peasant, Peter Morin, who really opened her eyes uh, to uh, what, she, what the best of Catholicism could be. So just uh, use this opportunity to go a little bit more into uh, kind of a basic biography of her life. So she wasn't um, raised in any faith. Uh, her parents were not particularly religious, uh, but she always felt uh, a calling to God and at different points in her life would go to church, maybe with neighbors and it was something she always felt a calling to, even though it wasn't a part of her family's regular life. Um, she was very well read from a young age. And uh, as a young girl, I'm not, I don't remember exactly how old she was, maybe uh, 13, 14, somewhere around there. Uh, she happened to, at that time, read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Uh, about the meatpacking industry in Chicago. And at that time, her family was living in Chicago. And so she used it as an excuse, like this book opened up her eyes to some of the injustice in her own city that she lived in. And she had a little brother uh, by the name of John, also named after her dad, I suppose. And she would, I guess, tell the family, I'm going to take John, I'm going to push him around in the stroller. And she'd use that as an opportunity to go into like the meatpacking industries and the neighborhoods that Upton Sinclair talked about in his book. Uh, so, and if you're not aware, Upton Sinclair was a communist and the book is blatantly communist. It's, you know, at the end, it ends, uh, I believe with a rally um, and is hoping I think his intent and hope was that at the end of the book, you'd be sold on the need for labor unions and for a more communist philosophy and perhaps form of government, and that you'd be working towards that. And so Dorothy Day was always very clear in her writings that it was the communists who um, opened up for her or you know, kind of brought her to the realization that she had a vocation to social justice and to work for the oppressed. Um, so she didn't find that from her early, um, from the times that she went to church. She found that from the communists. And so from a time period there in the late teens through the mid early mid twenties, um, she was uh, often wrote for communist newspapers. She had done a year of college in Illinois and then her family moved out to New York and she followed them. and. She worked for communist newspapers out there. And um, at this point, there's maybe the first major event that she doesn't write about in her book, uh, in her, uh, in The Long Loneliness. Um, she falls deeply in love with this, another newspaper man. And um, she becomes pregnant. It appears that he didn't want the child and wanted her to get an abortion. And she ends up getting that abortion, and uh, and then he's no longer around. She's still trying to follow him and rekindle that relationship that he's not interested in, and uh, kind of the additional event that she doesn't cover in the long loneliness is uh, there's an instance where someone notes um, in the apartment building that she's staying, and at the time someone smells uh, natural gas, and every 
it seems to be a consensus now that this was a suicide attempt, that she was so depressed over what was happening. Um, in the aftermath of that, um, she actually, another event that's not, is kind of, I'd say the main events that aren't mentioned are probably these events in like the early mid twenties. Uh, she's so depressed and just needs to get her mind off of everything that's been happening that there's a, a man that is going to be going to Europe. Um, she'd never been to Europe, thought it'd be fun. This man was very interested in her. And so they get married. And so uh, they have some fun in Europe. And then she comes back. And uh, actually, I don't remember if it was an annulment or a divorce, but they separate. And this is where then we kind of move to the second aspect of the book of natural happiness, where she meets Foster Batterham. As she calls him, he's an anarchist, an atheist, and a biologist. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if he actually had any uh, formal education in biology, but he was definitely someone who's very knowledgeable about the, uh, knowledgeable about nature, and it really enkindled her an appreciation for nature. And she views this as uh, a continuing of her journey to God. Um, because of her abortion, she thought that she couldn't get pregnant. And in 1927, she becomes pregnant with Foster Batterham. And in her book, The Long Loneliness, she mentions that she didn't think she could become pregnant. So this is a great joy for her, but she never mentions why she thought she could not become pregnant, but it was because of the abortion beforehand. And so this baby ends up being uh, a great joy for her, uh, but as uh, as the baby's going to be born and all, and <laughs> as the baby's going to be born, I think she's looking at her own life and um, this uh, pregnancy is kind of the final step for her to want to move to formulize formalize her relationship and commitment, her faith that's been kind of bubbling below the surface and shows she decides to have her baby baptized and to have herself baptized and while her pregnancy was a source of great joy uh, she notes that when she's baptized herself she receives uh, uh, what we <laughs> in the catholic church refer to as a conditional baptism because she had been baptized earlier but perhaps they couldn't find the records uh, so they did a conditional baptism just in case she remembered wrong or, <laughs> um, but that was a very dry period for her where she didn't really feel anything. She was more numb. And that was because this was the beginning of the end of her relationship with Foster Batterham, who she also dearly loved and they had gotten along well, but this, um, this religion of Dorothy was causing a wedge in their relationship. And she had decided that she would no longer be with him if they would not get married. He, as an anarchist and an atheist, was opposed to marriage as an institution. And so she actually moves from, um, moves from the New York area to get away from him, though she's constantly writing him letters of affection and hoping that they can get married. But... Um, this was something, it was only a few years ago that Dorothy Day's letters became open to the public. I guess it was more than a few years ago, but it's 25 years after her death, they became open to the public. And then a published edition, collected edition of her letters came out. And one of the things I noticed as I went through them was she has all of these letters, very sweet letters to Foster, but they end. <laughs> she, there are no more letters to him starting in December of 1932. And that's when she meets Peter Morin, who is kind of the third, encompasses the third and final chapter of her life. Well, the kind of the end of the second section of the book, she is now Catholic. She's not sure how to live that out. And she still sees the communists and the socialists as the ones who are most committed to the cause of social justice. She doesn't see that happening in the Catholic Church and isn't sure how to reconcile that, but also feels that she can't be a communist or a socialist anymore because of their atheist stance. So she still, during this time period, is often writing for their newspapers, uh, but, um, but doesn't want to go further than that. She feels <laughs> that that that's okay because she needs to support, as a single mother, she needs to support her child. Uh, 
Um, but she is at, she's having a conflict of how this can be lived out. And Peter Morin is kind of the answer to all these problems that she had during her first five years of being Catholic. And so Peter Morin, uh, who we'll dive a little bit more into shortly, uh, he happened, he hears from a couple of people while he's going around New York trying to spread his message, his social message of Catholicism that you should talk to Dorothy. I think she's someone that uh, you'd be on the same wavelength. And so Dorothy happens in December of 32. She's covering a hunger march in Washington, DC. He stops by her apartment. She's not there. Her uh, sister's there and says she'll be back later. And essentially when Dorothy does finally come back uh, from the hunger march in DC, Peter Morin's waiting for her <laughs> and, uh, and their relationship begins. But to be clear, it's a kind of a relationship in faith. Uh, Peter Morin was about 20 years older. And so they didn't, did not have a romantic relationship, but he paints this vision of the social vision, his social vision of Catholicism that really is the answer she's looking for that leads to what becomes known as the Catholic worker movement. So a little about Peter Morin. Uh, so he's 20 years older. He also dies about 31 years earlier than Dorothy. So co-founder of the Catholic worker, but much not nearly as well known um, because he had died so early and uh, Dorothy in any case. So he had died early and maybe not as sociable as Dorothy. He was really known for staying on point when he had conversations. He rarely shared any information about himself. And um, so the, the first person who wrote a biography of him 10 years after his death really had to do some deep searching, finding family members in France to interview and putting together his bio first biography was an extreme uh, um, labor of love, uh, where with Dorothy, there are certain parts of her life that she didn't write about publicly, but we know so much about her life that it's much easier to at least put to the bones together of a biography. But Peter here is uh, Peter probably in a church hall making a point as he was often known to do. And Peter would write in what are known as easy essays. And I thought it might be interesting to at least look at one. And so Originally, these are essays that uh, he, he would just speak in public squares, but later on, he started putting them in written form. And when the Catholic worker movement started, they were one of the hallmarks that were always featured in the newspaper. So, but this would be kind of typical Peter. This uh, easy essay is called Social Workers and Workers. The training of social workers enables them to help people to adjust themselves to the existing environment. The training of social workers does not enable them to help people to change the environment. Social workers must become social minded before they can be critics of the existing environment and free creative agents of the new environment. In houses of hospitality, Social workers can acquire the art of human contacts and that social mindedness or understanding of social forces. Oh, I'm sorry, with my, uh, I can't read the end of it because of the Zoom information on my page, but I have the essay right here to finish it. Uh, so in Houses of Hospitality, social workers can acquire that art of human contacts and that social mindedness, mindedness or understanding of social forces, which will enable them, which will make them critical of the existing environment and free creative agents of a new environment. So we can see a, a couple typical things of Peter here. He was very critical of academic education. Um, he thought that too many people, I mean, he hasn't mentioned this in this, essay, but he often felt that academics um, would focus so much on one area that they didn't necessarily understand the bigger picture that their work could fit into in society to make it better. Uh, but here we see a, another um, critique of Peter about 
academic education that it's often just preparing people to be functional in the current existing society and not doing work that could help to change society. And so um, here he's obviously speaking directly to the issue of social workers and the training of social workers. Uh, so this is uh, typical of Peter, but this is a kind of how he often talked and especially how he talked in public. And when he would go and be invited to talk at churches or universities, he would pull out a number of these essays. They would often have themes and the groupings that would go together and he would just read these essays. <laughs> so not talk about his life. If you went to go see Dorothy Day uh, speak, she would have been putting these stories and points about social justice, but couched in her life and what she saw, Peter's coming at it from a more distance, perhaps, perspective. Uh, but as I mentioned, Peter was a French peasant. Uh, he grew up on a, in a village, farming village in southern France. Uh, at her, uh, while he was a teenager, he moves out of the house and a few, uh, in a few instances takes temporary vows with the De, uh, De La Salle brothers, which are a teaching order. And after he graduates, uh, he does that after he graduates from high school and teaches for a while. Uh, then he was involved with a social Catholic social movement uh, in France for a short period of time. But in 1909, he decides to leave France and emigrate to Canada. Uh, it appears that the reason he left was that uh, he had been put into military service a number of times. Uh, France at this time having a having a difficult relation, the Catholic Church and the French Republic having a difficult relationship with one another, unlike perhaps in many countries where being a member of the clergy would exempt you from military service. France during this time did not honor that. So even when Peter Morin was a brother, there are times that he would have to participate in military service. He appears to have had a great dislike for this. And after he left the brothers, it appears he moved around France several times in avoidance of military service. And that, again, he didn't talk about himself. So some of this is piecing things together, but it appears that that was his main reason for leaving France, going to Canada where he lived on the land uh, with someone he met on the boat for a couple of years until that person uh, died in a hunting accident. And then he moves to the United States initially kind of as a uh, doing hard manual labor. And then in the early twenties, uh, late teens, he, finds pretty decent work, probably the least financially, the best he ever lived during his life. He becomes a French teacher. Uh, there are many folks in the Chicago area that wanted to learn French. And so he makes some pretty good money doing that. And then, so then he meets Dor uh, Then, then he has his conversion experience. He kind of views that time period where he's teaching French as maybe not his best, not his most Catholic time, though he doesn't go much into what that means. But then he has this, some at some point comes up with this new social vision, starts, stops charging for his lessons. He just does it uh, for a free will offering and starts writing these essays. And then sh shortly afterwards meets Dorothy. So, but Peter's, um, Peter's vision for society is that it needs to be founded on two, uh, principles, the works of mercy and voluntary poverty. And so some people might prefer the word simple living. Voluntary poverty for some has kind of a, a bad ring in their ears, but he viewed these two as needing to go together, that if one is going to be doing the works of mercy and really sharing of one's bounty, you can't do that if you're not willing to live with less. So for him, he wanted to kind of merge these two ideas into uh, forming a new society. And so what he works on with Dorothy is this notion of what he calls the green revolution. And so it has three parts, these round table discussions, houses of hospitality and farming communes. The houses of hospitality are probably what are most well known to people. Uh, but and it should be 
the Green Revolution, some people today think because of this farming aspect that that's what he meant. But by the Green Revolution, he was implying the Irish Revolution as opposed to the Red Revolution of the Russian communists of that time period, or Soviet communists. And so, you know, how accurate is Peter's reading of the Irish in the late antiquity and the early Middle Ages is debatable, but from the scholars he was reading at the time, he had this vision of during that time period of late antiquity, monks coming out from Catholic Ireland and re, you know, Christianizing Europe and setting up universities and uh, bringing culture to the people in, in the best sense of the word. And so it, it appears he also focuses on using his Irish easy essays more so when he's an Irish areas of Irish descent, such as Boston or New York. So the round table discussions, he viewed that as part of that was the newspaper that he and Dorothy Day printed. Uh, part of that was they would have gatherings initially outside the Catholic worker at a hall, but as the numbers sometimes would not be that large, it eventually moved to the Catholic worker itself. Um, and they would have discussions. He viewed discussion, you know, people coming together to have discussions about the important issues of the day as a critical and foundational aspect of creating a, a better society. The houses of hospitality, he viewed this as an opportunity for the rich to come into contact with the poor, which at least here in the United States, you know, with the onset of the inter, you know, interstates and highways and we've probably seen even greater demarcation and separation of the rich and the poor in our society. And he saw this as an important aspect of um, people needing to come into contact with one another. Uh, but it's, so most Catholic worker houses are some form of these houses of hospitality. Some are soup kitchens, some provide um, emergency shelter, some long-term shelter, some for families, some for single men or women. It's kind of depends on what the gifts of the people providing the hospitality are and what the needs are in a local area. I often refer to the last item here as Peter's end game uh, were the farming communes. So this is probably the least realized aspect of his vision. And I think it mirrors where he grew up, that he saw that as a, the village economy as a functional place. And so he saw large cities and industrialism as a place that bred poverty and anonymity and that a more a village type economy where people you know on a smaller scale would hopefully perhaps know one another uh, but are mostly living off of the land and you know feast and famine together uh, perhaps we'll get a little bit more into that later uh, here uh, on the right we have a picture of Peter speaking at a retreat at a Catholic worker farm in 1940. And uh, the picture on the left here, one of Peter Morin's heroes, uh, one of his favorite writers was Jacques Maritain. And so Jacques Maritain's next to Peter on the right uh, as one of the uh, time he came to New York and visited the Catholic worker. So, you know, oftentimes people today even mistake Dorothy for being a socialist, but after her conversion to Catholicism, uh, that was no longer the case. I don't know if she knew where she fell at that point, but when Peter came along, uh, she definitely became what we now call a distributist. And so just if folks are not familiar with that term, I, I go through these three terms of capitalism where, you know, to overly simplify, you have very few owners represented by Wall Street. Um, very few people are the owners that own the means of production. Uh, everyone else is more the workers. Uh, socialism, where you could say there are no owners, the power is in the government. And distributism, where the focus is that all should be owners, um, where we might often think of the family farm or Main Street. Um, if property is power, then spreading out this, uh, spreading out property is a way to spread out power and help equalize and make a more egalitarian society. And so, Important writers and thinkers for both Dorothy and Peter during this time are the English, distribu English Catholic distributists. Uh, pictured here from the left to the right, there's G.K. Chesterton, Hilaire Belloc, uh, Father Vincent McNabb, and Eric Gill. So these would be 
four prominent writers that we see mentioned time and again in the writings of Dorothy and Peter. Um, and then I just mentioned, this is a quote that Peter mentions regularly and so does Dorothy. So Saint Gertrude, um, Saint from the Middle Ages. Um, we don't have many of her writings, but this one quote is, oh, we, we have a few of her writings, but this quote is probably maybe her most popular property. The more common it becomes, the more, the more holy it becomes. In addition to the houses of hospitality, probably the most prominent aspect of the Catholic worker movement is Dorothy Day's pacifism. And so I'd say there's two sources that really bring about Dorothy Day's pacifism. One is Leo Tolstoy and the other is Gandhi. Uh, for Leo Tolstoy, his most prominent work on this is the kingdom of God is within you. And from Tolstoy, we not only see her pacifism, but also her anarchism. So for Tolstoy, it, his nonviolence went hand in hand with opposing state violence. And if one opposed state violence, for him, for Tolstoy and for Dorothy, there's this kind of marriage between pacifism and anarchism, uh, where he can't have one without the other. Um, Gandhi, whose nonviolence is also um, influenced by Tolstoy, adds some other aspects to Dorothy Day and Peter Morin's thought with his sense of community, simple living, his emphasis on arts and crafts. Uh, there's a quote of Gandhi uh, where Gandhi wrote, industrialism is evil, <laughs> where Peter Morin really enjoyed this quote and we do find that in his easy essays. Um, but also Gandhi's uh, civil disobedience, which isn't, um, while well, protesting, we do find that in the early Catholic worker movement, it's not really till later, more in the late 50s, that we start seeing civil disobedience that I think is, uh, well, in the Catholic worker movement probably came about because of a person by the name of Eamon Hennessy, but I believe was also influenced by Gandhi's work by the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. So uh, I said I was going to mention a little bit about myself and the current Catholic worker movement. Uh, for myself, I grew up in a place called Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's probably most well known for the fact that it hosts an American football team by the name of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, but I went to the school called Preble and it was a public high school, but we had uh, a few students who were Baptist, um, Christian Baptists, Put together a Bible study and we they were allowed to have it because no teachers were involved. So it happened at, on school grounds after school and I decided to join them and they did not have very positive views of the Catholic faith and it made me want to dig deeper into my own faith. So I went to my uh, local public library and started just finding books on the shelf on theology that I thought looked interesting. And one of them happened to be Dorothy Day's The Long Loneliness. So probably after the Bible, the most meaningful book for my life and how I've decided to live my life. Uh, it's just every page that I turned, uh, it was as if I was learning about my the ideals of my own faith without realizing that I had thought those thoughts before. So it just really resonated and uh, was life-changing for me. It would be a few years later when I moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to go to college, um, where there happens to be a Catholic worker here that I would check out the Catholic worker and become part of the community here. So on the right, uh, just to show a few pictures, here on the right is a picture of our main house. We have four houses. Uh, on a single block here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is Casa Maria in the spring where the tulips are popping up through the ground. Um, on the left here, we have a few pictures. One is of some families around Halloween, which is, if I understand right, is maybe not a, I think folks in Australia know of Halloween. I don't think it's very much celebrated, but uh, a big holiday at Casa Maria and we're, part, uh, we're carving pumpkins that night. Uh, a friend of mine here at Casa Maria by the name of Michael Comba, I was taking this picture for him, kind of one of his support people as he did a sit-in at Chase Bank, uh, which is the number one fossil fuel investor in the world. And so uh, on the win winter equinox, a few days before Christmas, he did a sit-in at the main Chase Bank branch downtown and was arrested there. 
Um, on the bottom left here is myself, uh, Dorothy Day and myself uh, share, uh, one thing we share in common is we're both war taxi sisters. And so in the United States, since about half of our um, US federal income taxes go to pay for the military and military related expenses uh, during her life, she refused to pay uh, that. And uh, I do likewise with many other Catholic workers. And then if in years where I maybe do owe money, I'll redirect those funds to uh, another cause. And then lastly, I have in the middle bottom here, there's Amada Morales. Um, one of the works that we got involved with recently was Child Protective Services. As we noticed, some of our mothers that were staying at the house, mothers you know, that we knew were good mothers as, you know, unlike many, um, you kind of your average shelter where someone might work there and go home at Casa Maria, the workers live there also. And so you get to know families pretty well and they get to know us. And uh, moms that we knew very well would have a CP, uh, child protective service case open and perhaps lose, in many cases, then lose their children. And um, as we did more digging, realized that it's uh, in the United States, um, uh, African-American child is twice as likely to be uh, named a victim of um, child neglect or abuse and uh, compared to a white child, uh, which means also the parents are twice as likely to be named a perpetrator. And then uh, African-American children are about three to sometimes four times more likely to be removed from the home. And uh, once the child's removed from the home, the chances of then uh, parental rights being terminated and being adopted out increase drastically. Uh, so that's an issue that we've gotten very involved with, and Ahmad has been our main person working on that issue. Let me move a couple slides ahead here uh, as I near the end of my presentation. So just a little bit about the Catholic worker in the 21st century. Uh, in the world today, there are nearly 200 Catholic worker communities but most of them are in the United States and most of them are houses of hospitality that you know, have soup kitchens, uh, provide housing, usually something on some variation of those two fronts. Uh, though there are nearly about 25 Catholic worker farms, again, mostly in, in the United States. And here's a picture of uh, Nashville Greenlands in Nashville, Tennessee, where um, actually the kind of the, uh, person with the beard in the middle, Carl Meyer, he met, uh, became involved with the Catholic worker and he was arrested with Dorothy Day in the late 1950s. And he started this Catholic worker farm called Nashville Greenlands uh, a couple decades ago. And uh, so there are, I'd say, especially with the notion of the growing awareness of the climate crisis, there's been a growing interest in the Catholic worker movement. And the back to the land aspect of Peter's writings that didn't exist before. Uh, and then protests are still, especially since the 1950s have become a more prominent aspect of the Catholic worker movement. This is uh, from 2017. It was a Good Friday witness in front of the White House that was sponsored by the Dorothy Day Catholic worker house in Washington, DC. And it was meant to highlight um, detainees in Guantanamo Bay and to, uh, to stop the torture there, to you know, recognize the torture, the need to stop that torture and to release those prisoners. And lastly, just some additional resources. As I mentioned, if you're only gonna, if you're interested, wanted to follow up and there is, you're looking for one thing about the Catholic worker to read, I'd recommend Dorothy Day's The Long Loneliness. I feel it's a spiritual classic and just very much worth reading. If you were going to read two books, <laughs> I had edited an edition that came out two years ago now called uh, it, this basic uh, is called the forgotten, the forgotten radical Peter Morin. It collects all of his published and uh, unpublished essays. It looks really thick, but as you know, his writings are look like poems, so it's not as torturous as it looks. And if you're looking for a third work that kind of filled out all of the gaps in those lives. Um, I think in, yeah, in 2020, there's a book called Dorothy Day that came out by Lowry and Randolph. 
Um, so not a religious book, more your straight biography, uh, but a very well done biography that really um, touches on the main aspects of their lives, their work and their context. So I'll stop there for now.